good morning good afternoon and good evening as the place you are in welcome to 62nd iomp school webinar and today's webinar is on radiation doses and risk in imaging to know or to neglect a very important topic and we have uh, two very eminent speakers for this webinar you know them very well but however as a customary i will try to introduce both of them uh, professor dr thomas fron very well renowned medical physicist scientist educator he will be talking on imaging doses in radiotherapy to know or neglect this topic is very important because since last 2 3 decades imaging is being used for planning and following up the dose delivery and also the low dose uh, low kv imaging and high kv me imaging the dose distribution and the risks are very different i will briefly introduce professor dr thomas cron whom i know for more than 3 decades and i have a very nice association he is phd fellow of iomp and iupsm and presently director of the physical sciences peter maclum cancer center in melbourne australia he has an interest in education and medical physics physicist and as you know he impcb he has contributed hugely as well as to afom and iomp his interest are in dosimetry of ionizing radiation image guidance and clinical trials and his 100 conference presentation 330 peer reviewed uh, papers in the journal shows his acumen he has received many awards if i go on speaking this one hour will not be enough to discuss about uh, his achievement uh, he has been uh, or uh, given order of australia medal in 2014 fellowship of iomp and iupsm life membership of the trans tasman radiation oncology group in 2020 and he is presently the member of the task group of the irs icrp which is dealing in uh, the dose uh, imaging dose in radiotherapy he was the first uh, professor kionari inamura memorial afom orator in 2018 and he will be speaking on imaging doses in radiotherapy to know or neglect the second speaker is also very well known to the iomp afom cpom every region and uh, uh, professor dr anjali kishan chanda he is also phd fiomp and fiu pesam and she will be talking on radiation induced cancer risk in medical imaging to know or neglect she uh, has contributed hugely to medical physics especially in thailand cpom region afom and also iom region as a director of medical physics graduate program at mahidol university bangkok thailand she has established medical physics education training graduate post graduate and phd program and now they uh, this program uh, they the medical physicist will be registered as a health professional by this year and uh, she is the chairman of uh, both this program of tulangong university she has established high medical physics society also she form also contributed to afom and uh, as you know uh, she was the uh, professor kionari namura memorial afom orator 2022 afom lifetime achievement award also she has received so i thank uh, professor thomas cron and anjali kishan chanda for agreeing to be speaker for today's webinar thanks to magdana who has organized this conference and asked me to moderate this uh, 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 webinar and uh, the work she is doing uh, is excellent thanks to iomp also for giving me this opportunity now up uh, during this talk you will have any question or queries please put them into q and a uh, section so that i will collect the questions and i will put 
to uh, the respective speakers and I will try to get a satisfactory answer from them. And uh, with these things, I will hand over the floor first to Professor Dr. Thomas Cron to speak on imaging doses in radiotherapy to know or neglect. So, Dr. Thomas Cron, the floor is yours now to speak on this webinar. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Arun. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good day, uh, good evening, wherever you may be and joining the, this webinar. Uh, I'm hoping that what we can do is really talk about an issue which is a worldwide issue, which is radiation dose in imaging. Uh, and if you would have asked me 20 years ago as a radiation therapy physicist, what is radiation dose, I would have said something of the order of gray, needs to be at least a gray as a radiotherapy physicist. My thinking really has changed over the years. Uh, and uh, while I'm trying to share my screen now, uh, I should thank uh, many of the, uh, the, the people present, in particular Professor Anchali, uh, for setting some of these thoughts straight. Uh, I should also thank IOMP and particularly Magdalena uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk here about something which was very new to me a couple of years ago, which is imaging doses in radiotherapy. Do they actually matter? Uh, do we need to know about them or can we comfortably neglect them? By now, you should be able to see uh, my uh, full screen uh, and the title uh, of, of the presentation. Please let me know if that doesn't work or you have, you have difficulties uh, hearing me. Yeah, it's visible. It's visible. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, before I get, get started with the presentation, I briefly wanted to introduce my uh, home uh, town and my home center, which is Peter McCallum Cancer Center, uh, which is located in Melbourne in Australia. Uh, this is the main campus, which you can see on the right. And you can see from the list of equipment and every, or all the bits and pieces uh, we have that we are a rather large radiotherapy department. But we are also associated to a very large imaging department. Uh, and without imaging, radiotherapy would not work or cancer treatment would not work. Uh, we have a PET-CT scanner. Uh, and uh, most importantly, uh, the physical sciences group, which I have the uh, honor to share, uh, uh, includes not just radiation oncology physicists, but also engineers and imaging people. And that is, I think, a very important layout, which may serve as something uh, which is helpful in the future. I should also declare my conflicts of interest. Uh, we have a research collaborative agreement with Varian uh, and a project with Reflection. And Reflection is sort of an interesting one. Uh, that is uh, the company which develops a PET uh, uh, image guided linear accelerator. Uh, and that shows already that imaging and therapy delivery have become such an integral part, uh, extending imaging really to its very frontiers like PET. Uh, I've also been a member of the ICRP task group on imaging dose and radiotherapy and participated in an astrophysics workshop. So some of the ideas which came from there uh, are uh, reflected in this presentation. If one looks at modern radiotherapy, uh, then you can see sort of the development of uh, radiotherapy from fixed SSD to isocentric conformal stereotactic IMRT VMAT to IGRT motion management and now adaptive radiotherapy. These are the sort of topics which you see featuring in journals like Medical Physics, Office Med Biol uh, and uh, uh, other journals. And you can see that all these developments really have helped uh, to improve patients treatment. It also goes along with more and more computer uh, uh, based uh, stuff. And if one actually looks at the imaging or the reliance on imaging, one can see that as time goes on and since about the 1980s, when CT scanning into, was introduced into radiotherapy planning, uh, imaging has been integral of, uh, to all these activities. 
So what I'd like to do in the next 20 minutes or so is uh, give you three minute blocks uh, of bits and pieces which I thought could be interesting in this context. The topic of imaging dose in radiotherapy is way too big and is so much informed also from things in diagnostic, uh, in diagnostics, which uh, Professor Anchali will uh, cover after this presentation, that it's uh, impossible to cover everything. But I thought by just telling you a bit about why, how we uh, uh, look at, at radiation dose and then look at what tools do we have uh, there in order to make sense and help our patients in the context of imaging and getting imaging right in that balance between adequate and appropriate imaging and minimizing radiation dose. So let's get started with why do we need to know the radiation dose? Well, radiation dose is both good and bad. In radiotherapy, we think of radiation dose as the goodie. Radiation therapy, in radiation therapy, dose is the good guy. It's good to give radiation dose to the tumor. We want to give as much dose as we possibly can. But then on the other hand, we can never be sure that radiation dose uh, is not also causing other damage to surrounding normal structures. After all, patients are living and we want to keep it that way. And there's generally no reason why there should be a threshold for uh, the minimum dose. So we basically come to the conclusion that we, whatever dose there is, we should try to reduce it if it is going to normal tissues, to uh, valuable parts of the anatomy. Uh, and uh, we try to need to optimize everything with radiation dose, radiotherapy dose in terms of beam shaping, in terms of conformality and imaging dose in terms of the dose of roll and the frequency uh, of, of imaging. Uh, in a way that maximizes the, risk, the uh, chance of tumor control and minimizes the risk uh, of uh, secondary cancers. Why is that a particular topic now? Well, imaging frequency is increasing. Uh, virtually every new C uh, linear accelerator these days is sold with cone beam CT scanning on board. Radiotherapy also relies much more than imaging on certain types of motion management, and that increases the frequency and complexity of imaging. For example, 4D CT reconstructs 10 images, 10 times the same dose, hopefully not, but still 10 times enough dose to give adequate imaging uh, images in each of the phases. Then radiation protection becomes more elaborate and we understand radiation protection really more and, and, and more and understand what is the underlying science of radiation protection and radiotherapy uh, has contributed more and more to this understanding of the radiobiology. Then the dose from KV imaging is also distributed quite differently from radiotherapy and we will see a bit more about that in a minute. We can also see that if I buy a modern linear accelerator, uh, then all the majority of bits and pieces attached to that linear accelerator are actually there for imaging. It's only the treatment head with the MLC, which uh, does the, the radiation dose delivery. Virtually everyone, everything else is really there to give images. And if one looks at image uh, guidance uh, approaches, this is a, a table which will come into the ICRP report. Uh, there are all these different in, uh, imaging technologies uh, with a variety of different modifications, dimensions, doses, motion management, and, and a variety of, of comments there. But I think I need to draw your attention, particularly on KV cone beam CT imaging, uh, because CT is the tool of choice in radiotherapy because it is three-dimensional and radiotherapy is a three-dimensional uh, issue. It is distortion-free and that's obviously really, really, really important uh, because if we want to get radiation dose to a particular point, we need to know uh, where it is. It allows dose calculation uh, and is directly related to treatment planning. So if I do image guidance on a linear accelerator, I would like to have the most direct pathway to my treatment plan and CT scanning would allow that. So what about the dose in, in the, this context? Uh, if one 
uh, we've started many years ago uh, by auditing all our uh, imaging kit in radiotherapy and starting out by our CT scanner in treatment planning. You can see here uh, that the CT scanner in radiotherapy uh, produces uh, radiation doses which are typically higher than the conventional radiation uh, doses in 3D CT. In particular, if you were to use 4D CT imaging, it is one step, one uh, order of magnitude higher even than the CT scans for uh, the anatomical collagenation and attenuation correction used in PET scanning. And that all really makes perfect sense. The take home message from this uh, study is really that a 4D CT, a breathing gated 4D CT, should have not more than twice the radiation dose than a conventional CT scan, which basically means that the image quality on each of the phases in the uh, 4D CT scan is probably slightly worse than the 3D scan, uh, but overall uh, not uh, uh, still useful for the purpose uh, which is, is uh, required. Uh, I should just sort of point out that the, the uh, doses we are seeing here on the y-axis are doses in milligray, uh, and uh, 20 milligray is typically the dose uh, which is given at Dmax by two monitor units in a therapy radiation beam. So it's not that high, but it is about 1% of the radiation dose given in, uh, in their treatment, uh, in a typical radiotherapy treatment. And that's something we comfortably uh, achieve as such. So a percent, but how often do we give that percent uh, 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 overall? This is certainly a question. And then uh, we are measuring radiation dose in a different way. Here we are seeing the CTDI, the computed tomography dose index. And, and that is something which I think by now most radiotherapy physicists also would have at least heard about because it is such an important tool in order, order to quantify radiation dose. Unlike uh, in radiotherapy where we need to quantify the radiation dose in what we would call a PTV or a GTV, uh, in imaging uh, we are irradiating a much larger volume, as you can see here. So what we need is a dose value which is representative to the radiation, for the radiation dose or the damage in the patient really achieved uh, there. And that can, can, can consist of two different things, of uh, the radiation dose in a single slice of the CT scanner or uh, in the, uh, uh, the CT dose in the overall volume which has been imaged. And, and that's probably the most relevant uh, 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 quantity, uh, which is called the dose length product. So it's these two measures which are important in, in this context. They're typically in diagnostics measured in perspex, uh, and that is something uh, which Professor Anne Charlie will, uh, has a lot more experience uh, with overall. You can see, however, already that we are very quickly running into problems if uh, we are using corn beam CT because there this idea of a narrow fan beam and a sort of slice which is imaged or irradiated in a patient really does not hold and we are needing to make some adjustments in this context. And you can see that really quite nicely here in a very in a paper which is now already 12, 13 years old, uh, which uh, by Jun Deng, uh, where he compared the radiation doses delivered in an IMRT treatment for a prostate. So this is the dose from prostate radiotherapy treatment. You can see the high dose is really in the prostate. This is the percentage uh, uh, dose uh, there. And the highest doses are really just there and everywhere outside are really rather low doses. If I take the imaging, the Conbeam CT, which actually localized the prostate in the first place, then the dose looks like this. And it looks a bit like that cylinder you've seen in the previous slice, that perfect perspex cylinder for the CTDI. You can also see that the dose distribution is actually looking quite differently. The maximum dose is not in the center at all. The maximum dose is in the periphery at the entrance where the radiation beam enters when you rotate around the patient. And the maximum dose is also in bone uh, where uh, because of the KV dose given. So what we see and what we need to learn in radiotherapy as a radiotherapy physicist is 
really that dose is different. Scatter is very different. Field size reductions reduces the dose uh, 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 everywhere. And uh, we need to think about radiation dose in a different way. If one looks at Monte Carlo calculations as really the best tool, because uh, it is quite difficult to calculate radiation doses from KV uh, uh, doses, as we all know from superficial beams, uh, then Monte Carlo calculations can provide these dose distributions. And you can see here a dose distribution uh, we've seen, uh, we've, we've done ourselves uh, there. And this is uh, a student in our institution who just has done a radiotherapy treatment plan for lung cancer uh, uh, using a, 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 a an IMRT distribution and then added a cone beam CT. And you can see here that the cone beam CT adds only really not a huge amount of radiation dose. However, if your cone beam CT is done daily and potentially as a verification over and over again, it starts to become part of the, uh, of the issue, in particular if it's not just in the target, but also all around. This year is quite a nice paper uh, uh, from uh, 2018, which provides a good summary uh, and where people looked at uh, more than uh, nearly 5,000 patients, uh, looked at average and cumulative free imaging doses uh, in, in these cases in their brain, in lungs uh, and uh, bone marrow. Uh, and you can see these doses are uh, uh, of, of uh, particularly rather in, in centigrade, they are sort of varying quite a bit. And I think that's probably the most important take home message here to say that the risk and the radiation doses in from the imaging really depends very much on the technique. And there is a huge variety uh, of radiation doses from imaging, which basically means that some patients we really indeed do not need to care. But for other patients where we get radiation doses, let's say of two, three gray, uh, uh, they are from the imaging. Uh, well, we clearly need to look at that in particular if we look at these large volumes there. And that becomes obviously even more important in a pediatric uh, 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 environment. And, and this recent paper uh, looked at a pediatric setting uh, and uh, basically come up comes up with a cone beam CT adding on average, and again, huge variability, uh, there are about 0.01% uh, uh, cancer risk per patient year. Now, if this is over 50 years, then we are getting already close to a percent in terms of radiation dose. And that is assuming that the imaging is done in an optimized way. We should also, on the other hand, keep in mind that good imaging can allow us to reduce the radiation uh, field of a treatment. So if I can localize my target better, in this case, a study we did on uh, bladder cancer, and if we can image the bladder every day and adjust the field size, we actually overall reduce the integral dose to the patient. So imaging can also not just add dose, but also reduce those. So that means physicists who know about optimization are really called upon. Quick note on how representative is imaging from one unit to another. And we are lucky that we've got 14 different Linux, uh, 14 uh, identical uh, Linux accelerators in our institution. And we basically went through all of these and looked at the, the doses from different protocols, which are nominally identical. And you can see that not only nominally, but typically they are all within roughly about 5%. So whatever we learn from one linear accelerator is probably useful also for another. Makes life easier. Uh, and uh, the ICRP uh, uh, task group also did a survey uh, on cone beam CT. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, the, the idea was really just to establish how much is cone beam CT used all over the world. Uh, and, and this includes uh, not only high income countries, but also, uh, as you can see here, low and middle income countries. And you can see here that cone beam CT is virtually available in all countries all over the world. So it is something where we do need to think about optimization. And those can be optimized on many different levels. Uh, and I don't want to give you an absolute recipe on, on how this is uh, 
can be done because every scenario is different. Every patient is, is different and clearly starting at the pediatric end probably makes sense. But what we should be doing is probably uh, think of optimization in as a two step or two possibility uh, uh, area. We can do optimization on individual patient levels or we can do uh, them on machine levels. And these are sort of things uh, which are things with some of them which you can do in the clinic, protocols, for example, and some of them you have to do with a manufacturer to, together. And the manufacturers are developing more and more exciting tool and, uh, tools. And I just show you here some of the spectral imaging, which is currently coming out uh, there, which obviously allows for very significant dose reduction uh, as well. However, it's generally true to say that improvements from diagnostic imaging are very, very slow to come through into radiotherapy. So we can do things ourselves. For example, we can calm down our corn beam CTs if the patient, uh, if the volume of the patient is, is we want to image is not as, as large, or we can put filters in there uh, as we did when we started out uh, in a. a uh, in corn beam CT imaging. Uh, we also optimized in our institution the dose and image quality from corn beam CT protocols uh, in, uh, on our varying tribune linear accelerators. And the important aspect there is, uh, these are the, the results uh, we, we had and the dose reduction factor from the manufacturer's uh, settings to what we ended up with is sort of typically of a factor of two. So we are basically saving with our customized imaging protocols uh, about a factor of two for radiation dose. But the important part is that this acquisition or the improvement of dose uh, and image uh, was not done on the basis of in, uh, making image quality worse. We included included RTTs who actually do the image matching on the treatment unit to judge as image, image quality and asked the radiation oncologists what they actually thought. So this highlights the fact that imaging in radiotherapy is really a multidisciplinary task where the physicists can lead, but the physicists cannot do everything. So I'd like to leave you with that, that, that idea that this is not a good idea. Radiotherapy physicists do need to know about imaging. Who else should know about imaging dose? For example, the physicists have at least the knowledge about dose. They understand what a milligray is. They understand what a CTDI should, should be like. If you look at all the other people involved there, they have other specialties and other in interests and contribute to patient treatment. Uh, but imaging dose is something the physicist in this case, the radiotherapy physicist needs to, needs to know about. What does the radiotherapy physicist need, need to, to think about? Well, the metrics, CTDI and DLP, we've talked about. Uh, we also need to think that the imaging needs in therapy are different than, than diagnostics. We don't need to diagnose anything. We have the patient already with a cancer. We need to contour and then find back on the treatment unit what we wanted to uh, wanted to treat. We need to learn about the tools. Uh, we need to talk much more to our manufacturers and go away from these black boxes uh, the manufacturers try to, to give us and ask them over and over again, can you put some optimization tools uh, in, in there and talk to our diagnostic physicists. One needs to keep in mind that imaging uh, in radiotherapy has a different, different purpose than in imaging. So we can't just take over what the imaging physicists uh, uh, say. They are really, really important for us. And we have so much to learn from them, but not everything is identical as you can see here. Finally, can we actually uh, uh, measure radiation dose? What tools do we have? Yes, audits are, are there and dose reference levels are things which come, come in 
uh, there. Audits are possible. We did an audit with a, uh, this quasar phantom uh, where we went to 14 centers and looked at radiation dose in cone beam CT uh, out, out there. This is something also other centers have done. Uh, and that leads to what is called dose reference levels. I don't want to, in the interest of time, really talk much about dose reference levels, uh, but just point you, you to the publications of Tim Wood uh, and the UK group, uh, where they uh, also did a survey of imaging uh, uh, overall, and I think the conclusion really says it, says it all. There is a factor of 18 difference between lowest and highest dose from scanners. I think we as radiotherapy physicists really have a long way to go to at least optimize things around the same factor. And that is really what uh, dose reference levels are all about. I don't think I need to go into the dose reference levels there. The slides will be distributed uh, uh, overall. And I think the dose reference levels as a tool of improving radiation dose by measuring radiation dose, seeing what the patterns of care are, and then saying you all should be really at least as good as three quarters of your peers. And then repeating that over and over again is a very nice tool of improving radiation dose. So why do we need to know those? We talked already about uh, the, uh, uh, the cancer risk and uh, the lack of a th um, very likely lack of a threshold, but there is more coming out there. And uh, there are new toxicities, cardiac toxicity, interaction of toxicity in different organs. For example, uh, we have seen more lung toxicity if we irradiate the heart uh, in clinical trials. There's considerable differences in radiation sensitivity between patients and a very interesting uh, thing evolves now in the context where we discover immune therapy and immune uh, uh, the immune system as a helper for our treatments that uh, even low doses like one or two gray as we easily can give from imaging can lead to very significant uh, suppression of the immune system. There are a couple of other important documents. Uh, the WAPM has given, has issued a, a, a task group report. Uh, ESTRO has uh, put together a number of interesting uh, uh, documents, in particular with AFOM. Uh, but I think in conclusion, I hope that these three minute bits have uh, helped you to at, at least motivate you to consider this not as the end, but consider really a very delicious dish uh, and a very a good and deep understanding uh, of imaging dose uh, as the ob object of uh, radiotherapy physicists in the future. Lots of acknowledgements, in particular Colin Martin, the chair of the ICRP task group, uh, and particularly all of you uh, for your attention. So thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Thomas, for the excellent talk. And uh, uh, you have emphasized that in the radiotherapy, the imaging technology is mostly the CBCT or uh, KB beam is going to give large amount of uh, uh, imaging doses and that cannot be ignored and that must be calculated. And many organizations have seized of this problem. I see RP also has come up and put the task force and definitely there will be some recommendations for these things uh, in coming days we'll get those things. A lot of questions are pouring in but I will keep the question answer at the end of the talk and I thank Thomas Crom. More than 1600 delegates have joined this uh, webinar shows the interest into IOMP webinar and the topic also. For the participant, the recording of this webinar will be available on IOMP website within one or two days. CPD accreditation is under process and you will be intimated by email soon. And if you have any question queries, please put them into Q&A because if you put into the chat box, they may be lost. So please put them into Q&A. Now the next speaker is uh, uh, Professor uh, Anchali Kishan Chanda, very well known figure as I 
talked about and she has done a huge amount of work into imaging doses and very well we know that radiation is a dual age sword and therefore it can have ability to cause the cancer, risk of cancer and therefore Anjali will be talking on radiation doses and risk in imaging to know or neglect and uh, uh, Professor Anjali, now floor is yours for your talk and we will gain from your huge experiences. Welcome, Professor Anjali. Thank you very much, Professor Arun Chokun. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great honor to be invited by IOMP School webinar for as a panelist uh, on this session. So the, the title of my presentation uh, will be uh, in imaging, but uh, this is a uh, uh, human resource of uh, our medical imaging at the King Jhulalongkorn Memorial Hospital and uh, Faculty of Medicine, Jhulalongkorn University. And uh, we have a lot of uh, facilities uh, in medical imaging for the clinical studies. The title of my presentation will be Radiation Induced Cancer Risk in Medical Imaging to Know or Neglect. And the outline will be started with the introduction, five risk models, lifetime attributable risk estimation for medical imaging, conclusion, and finally, it's a recommendation. For the introduction, I'm pleased to introduce the International Atomic Energy Agency Human Health Series number 25. The title is a role and responsibility of clinically qualified medical physicists in a term of a radiation risk. It is a risk assessment and identify potential radiation emergency incident resulting from equipment malfunction or human errors. <coughs> The risk assessment and management consists of uh, the following to measure the radiation levels uh, for the staff and the public exposed, to establish the methods for radiation dose to the staff and to reduce the associated risk, and to provide consultation on the doses received by patients, personnel on the associated risk, and recommend measure to minimize the chance for accident to happen again. So this is uh, from IEA Human Health Series number 25 on the radiation risk. So then I would like to uh, define the term risk model. Risk model is a quantitative mean for translating radiation exposure into corresponding health risk. We already know that uh, the effect of ionizing radiation are highly dependent on those. So the exposure of a moderate and high dose is above 100 millisievert, and the low dose is below 100 millisievert. In epidemiological information used to develop cancer risk model comes from exposure to moderate and high radiation doses of over 100 millisievert. There are two risk models. The first one is a relative risk, the abbreviation is RR. And the second is the absolute risk, is a abbreviation is AR. The relative risk is the ratio of the rate of occurrence of disease in an exposed population to the non-exposed population. And the excess relative risk, ERR, it is a relative risk minus one or ERR equal to RR minus one. And is the proportional increase in the baseline risk. The second risk model, absolute risk, AR model, is presumes a constant absolute increase of risk per dose unit, regardless of a baseline risk. The excess absolute risk EAR, it is a difference in the rate of occurrence of a disease between the exposed population and a comparable non-exposed population. The next term I would like to introduce to you is a lifetime attributable risk or LAR. LAR is a probability of a premature incidence of cancer attributable to radiation exposure 
in a representative member of the population. LAR is the additional cumulative probability of having a specific cancer up to the eight, which we call attain it. For example, it is 89 years. In the equation, you can see that LAR is, is equal to the integration of the MDAG multiplied by the ratio of uh, SAG over SEGDA, where MDAG is a risk model, and the SAG is a probability of surviving cancer-free to it, A, for the unexposed population. And the ratio of uh, SAG over SEG, this is a conditional probability of a person alive and cancer-free at the edge at exposure E to reach at least the attain edge, EA. And L, this L, it is a minimum latency period. The risk model MDEAG can be defined in three ways. The first one is an additive transfer. So MDAG is equal to excess absolute risk. And the second way is a multiplicative transfer. It is equal to excess relative risk, DEAG multiplied by MAG. And the third way is a weighted arithmetic sum of both. So the MDAG equal to the summation of the weighting factor multiply excess absolute risk and plus the one minus weighting factor multiply excess relative risk and also multiply MAG, where MAG is a baseline cancer incidence rate in the population. And the W is a weighting factor, which is a risk transfer weight. The transfer of excess risk between population the risk model MDAG allows the transfer of risk estimate from one context to another. For example, from the population providing data from which the risk model was derived to another population with a different baseline cancer risk. The extra cancer risk resulting from a particular exposure to radiation can be expressed either as a multiplicative model excess relative risk or an additive model excess absolute risk. Different combination between two models of interaction are possible. Although the selection of either of these two approaches may take little difference to the predicted radiation-related excess risk for the population from which the epidemiological data were derived, it can make a substantial difference when the risk model is transferred to another population. This is particularly critical for cancer sites with a baseline incidence or mortality rates differ markedly between two populations. This slide shows the risk transfer approaches. The cancer site is a leukemia, and there are three risk models of unscare, BAS7, and ICRP103. For the leukemia, it can be 100% ERR and 100% EAR, where BAR7 used 70% EAR and 30% of EAR, and ICRP used 100% EAR. Uh, similarly, for the thyroid cancer, for the unscare, for the BAR7 and ICRP breast cancer, and all solid cancers of uh, a uh, weighting factor for BAR7 and another weighting factor for ICRP103. For the risk transfer weight adopted, so for the different cancer size, such as uh, leukemia, the transfer weight adopted, in order to calculate a lifetime attributable risk, it used a weighting factor of 0 0.5, and this evidence the transfer weighting choice by unscare BAS7, EPA, and ICRP. For the thyroid cancer, weighting factor is 0 0.5. This is uh, the choice by Jacob et al. in the year 2006 and Walsh in 2009. For the breast cancer, it is 100% EAR and the weighting factor is 1. 
This is supported by Preston et al. in the year 2002. All other solid cancer weighting factor is 0 0.5. This is a weight choice by ICRP to, to 2007. We are very familiar with a bad seven. So this is an example of a weighting factor for each cancer site. For example, uh, thyroid, the weighting factor is one, as well as a gallbladder and the brain and CNS. While the breast, uh, there is a weighting factor is zero, and uh, most other cancer, it is weighting factor is 0 0.7. So this is uh, for, from a bad seven weighting factor. The other term that I would like to introduce to you in order to estimate the lifetime attributable risk, those term is a dose and dose rate effectiveness factor, DDREF. So if you look at this curve, it's plot between the radiation dose to the colon in the unit of a milligray from one until 10,000 milligray. And on the Y axis, it is a number of solid cancer per 100,000 people. And this curve show the high dose. This high dose is a modest upward curvature it's observed in the overall dose response for solid cancer. The need to apply the factor when extrapolating from cancer risk assessed at high dose and high dose rate to estimate the risk at the low dose and low dose rate. This factor is called dose and dose rate effectiveness factor or DDREF. DDREF represent the ratio between risk at high dose, high dose rate, and at low dose and low dose rate. ICRP proposed DDREF for, of two for radiation protection purposes. And the BAS 7 report proposed DDREF is 1.5. DDREF, when we consider uncertainty, it led to the development of probability distribution of DDREF for use in the risk assessment. The risk estimate was similar to those among atomic bomb survivors, suggests that DDREF of one is reasonable. There are three factors influencing radiation-related health risks. Those factors are the first one is it at exposure. The second factor is a time since exposure and attain it. And the third factor is a gender. So if you look at this curve, you can see that uh, the top one is a HCT and the it at exposure start from a zero until 80 years old. And uh, on the y axis, this is an organ dose. So for the head CT, the highest organ dose is uh, from brain, which is around 90 milligray at the edge at exposure zero. And when the edge exposure increase to five, 10, 20, so the organ dose decrease rapidly into about 20 milligray. And after that, it is a constant until the edge of 80 and is followed by bone in the green color and the bone marrow and the thyroid. So the, the et, et exposure is a very important factor on the health risk. And if we look at the abdominal CT, so you can see that the highest dose is the stomach and the highest is about 30 milligray uh, at the et, uh, of zero and then decrease rapidly until the edge of 20. And after that, it's become constant until the edge of 80. And uh, after the stomach, it is uh, lower by the liver dose and the ovary is a uh, smaller colon and the bone marrow. So this is an example of it at exposure and time since exposure and attain it. And the final factor, it is a gender. If you look at this uh, graph, you can see the ex ex exposure from zero until 80. And uh, on the Y axis, it is a lifetime attributable cancer risk per 1 million individual exposed to uh, 10 milligray. So at the lower edge of a zero, the LAR is around close to 5,000. 
And uh, when the edge increasing to 10, 20, so the LA are decreasing rapidly until 30. And after that, it's slow decreasing until the age of 80. This is a curve of a female. When we compare the female to the male, we can see that LAR of the female start from zero eight years. So it's uh, only 2,500. <clears throat> 2, it's uh, much lower than the female, nearly half okay, of the female. <clears throat> And then it decreased rapidly until the age of 30 and then slowly decreased until really close to the female at the age of 80. So this is the two, three curve show the three factors influence the health risk. Uh, that those are age at exposure time since exposure and attain age and also the gender. The source of uncertainty came from exposure estimates for the general population, as well as the first year dose estimation in the term of organ doses and the lifetime doses. <clears throat> this is a risk model for leukemia mortality. It is an unscare in the year 2006 report that used excess absolute risk EAR an excess relative risk model for leukemia mortality for two conditions of a quadratic response and linear quadratic response. But at the present assessment, ERR and ERR model with a linear quadratic dose response were used. Okay. The coefficient of leukemia mortality linear quadratic models fitted to the current data of the survivors of the atomic bomb in Japan. This slide show excess relative risk model. It is a generalized ERR model. And in this equation, you can see ERR equal to the lambda AEDG multiplied by many parameters in the bracket, where D is a radiation dose in the unit of sievert, and A is a attain it. E is it at exposure, G is a gender or sex. And there are many parameters, fit parameters, uh, like alpha, beta over alpha in a unit of perceived. And the kappa, it is a constant. Where the lambda represents sex and its specific baseline cancer incidence rate in the number of cases in 100,000 people. So this is an ERR model. Similarly to EAR model, this is a generalized EAR model, which you can see similarly of a linear quadratic model with the exponential of uh, many parameters like this, where lambda represents sex and age specific of a baseline cancer incidence rate. It's in a number of cases in 100,000 people. Now, I would like to start with the cancer risk model number one. In the year 2006, uh, UNSCAR report, UNSCAR stands for United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effect of Atomic Radiation. UNSCAR derived specific risk models for leukemia, thyroid, stomach, colon, liver, lung, female breast, esophagus, bladder, bone, brain, CNS, non-melanoma skin, and all other solid cancers combined. And SCAR applied this model to the current baseline rates in China, Japan, Puerto Rico, United Kingdom, and the United States of America. So this is a first a cancer risk model. The second one is a 2006-7 report. BAS stands for biological effect of ionizing radiation, and BAS derived site-specific cancer risk model for leukemia and other 10 solid cancer as in the, in the bracket, and all other solid cancers combined. These estimates are based on the United States of America cancer incidence rate between 1995 to 1999. Cancer risk model number three, it is ICRP 2007 recommendations, which derives specific risk model for leukemia and other solid cancer. It's applied those model to cancer incidence data from six different Asian and Euro-American populations. This risk model assumes a sex average and age 
at the exposure average population to generate nominal cancer incidence risk coefficient in the context of the system of radiological protection. Cancer risk model number four, it is a United States Environmental Protection Agency or EPA, which modified an extended bas 7 risk model in the year 2011, including other solid cancer sites. The United States National Cancer Institute, this is a risk model number five. It is a NCI Institute, which published in the year 2012 it is an online radiation risk assessment tools or RAT, RAT to calculate lifetime cancer risk from single or multiple exposure, including uncertainty distribution based on bas 7 methods with a number of small modifications and include list model for seven additional cancer sites. The following will be the cancer risk from medical imaging. This slide shows typical effective dose value associated with the medical imaging. And we can separate it into three groups. The first group is radiography and fluoroscopy. The examination starts from hand, dental, chest, mammography, lumbar spine barium, enema, and the diagnostic coronary angiogram. The effective dose started from less than 0.1 millisievert and the highest is from diagnostic coronary angiogram, which is a 5 to 10 millisievert. The second group of a computer tomography from head, CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis, until, until coronary CT angiogram. The dose started from the range of 0 0.5 to 2 millisievert from head until 1 to 15 millisievert of coronary CT angiogram. And the third group is a nuclear medicine, the radionuclide imaging, which is a lung, bone, and myocardial perfusion. Effective dose is range from 2 to 3 millisievert to 12 to 14 millisievert of a myocardial perfusion. So you can see that the CT will show the highest dose of 15 millisievert. This slide shows the growth of a CT procedures from the year 1993 until the year 2006. And on the y-axis, it is the number of uh, uh, CT procedures in a million. So you can see in 1993, the number of uh, CT procedures is 18 million. Until the year 2006, the total number of uh, CT procedures is 62 million. The increasing of uh, annual growth is more than 10% per year. And uh, if we extended the growth of a CT from the year 1993 up to the year 2017, this is from a NCRP report number 184 in the year 2019. It is a medical radiation exposure of patients in the United States. You can see that the number of CT exposure increasing rapidly until uh, the year 2011 of 85.3 million is very large amount. And after that is decreasing a little bit, decreasing uh, 2012 and 2013 and a little increase and decreasing and increase and decreasing. So this is very interesting of a medical radiation exposure to the patient from the large number of a CT scan in the United States. So when we look at the percent contribution of various CT categories of a total number of 84 million of a CT scan in the United States in the year 2016, so you can see that the large percentage is abdominal pelvis of 26%. And the second is the brain of an 18.9%. And the third is a chest, 15.9%, and uh, followed by CT angiogram of a 15.5. The rest will be a PET CT, spec CT of uh, about 2%, CT angiogram, and etc. So this, the contribution of everything is around 84 million of a CT scan in the United States. What about the patient radiation dose from CT scan? 
you can see there are about seven columns of a lot of information from CT protocol, clinical indication, frequency, and etc. But I would like to show you that uh, the highest uh, median value of effective dose follow ICRP publication 103. The liver multiphase, the effective dose in the median value, it is 19.4 millisievert. And the 75th percentile, it is 22.4 millisievert. This is the largest amount of effective dose uh, among all of the CT protocol. What about lifetime attributable risk of cancer incidence for the, some selected organ? In this table, you can see different organ from stomach until leukemia and all cancer. And there are three groups of the it at exposure from five years old, 10 years old, and uh, also 40 years old. It is it of exposure among male and female. And the highlight is uh, for the male, the LAR. This is LAR, the amount, highest amount for male is uh, 285 at colon at the age of exposure five years old. And for the female, it is a uh, lung and the breast of a 608 and a 914 LAR, which is a risk of cancer incidence for the female at the age of five. When the age of exposure increased to 10 years old, the LAR a little decreasing. And at 40 years old, the LAR almost it decreased to half of the five years old. So it, it exposure is very important as well as the gender, male and female uh, exposed. This is our study at uh, our country in Thailand at the two centers. It is a number of uh, CT examination the total number of CT examination between 2018 to 2022 at two centers, it's, uh, it is about 357,000 uh, of a CT examination. We collect the data of the patient who get the dose at a cumulative effective dose over 100 millisievert, which is a high dose or moderate dose and uh, also six organ dose. And the age range of the patient is uh, between uh, 22 to 39, so it's lower than 40 years old. We also collect uh, both gender, body weight, clinical indication, and the CT protocol. From this table, you can see that uh, there are eight patients with accumulated effective dose over 100 millisievert. And uh, the first patient is a female, 38 years old, with a CT abdomen. The high dose, organ dose, it at the colon of a 201 milligray. And the uterus is around 193 milligray. And after that, it is a CED 110. It is at the lung, 160 milligray. The next patient is 142 milligray at liver and colon for the CT brain and whole abdomen. CT whole abdomen also show the liver at 149, 150 milligray, and the other is 155 milligray organ dose of the liver and 142. In the case of a CTA, the high dose is at lung of uh, about 180 milligray. And a CT KUB, it's about 139 milligray at the, at the liver. So this is the example of a patient dose of over 100 millisievert of accumulated effective dose with a high organ dose, about six organ that uh, we can uh, get the, the number and showing to you. After we get the organ dose of six organ, we can estimate the lifetime attributable risk per 100,000 of a cancer incidence and also cancer mortality uh, among the patient age of less than 40 years, which is very sensitive to radiation and cumulated effective dose over 100 millisievert. So this is LAR for per 100,000 of cancer incidence 
And on the right column is LAR per 100,000 uh, 100, of a cancer mortality. So you can see that uh, the patient with a higher cumulative effective dose, we have a LAR in the term of 52 at colon. And the second patient is a liver 72 and 71 LAR and uh, mortality uh, cancer is a 70. And then it is uh, LAR at the breast of this patient uh, 82. And the next patient is a 67 at colon and 61. And another patient, female patient 77 LAR followed by CTKUB of a 60. Uh, uh, LAR. So this is the example of a lifetime attributable risk per 100,000 of the cancer incident and the cancer mortality. Uh, Professor Antli, uh, I, because we'll need to have some questions also. Uh, can you... Uh, yeah. oh? Can I have uh, about uh, two more slides? Presentation, okay? Okay. 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 So, even though the risk uh, to an individual patient may be small, but uh, with increasing large number of patients exposed, coupled with increasingly high exposure per examination, it could translate into many cases of cancer resulting directly from radiation exposure from CT. And it is very important to understand how much radiation medical imaging delivers especially in a younger female patient, the benefits from CT imaging must be balanced against the potential harm from its associated radiation. This is our recommendations. CT examination protocol and techniques should be optimized and standardized to limit the radiation associated with individual uh, studies uh, in order to reduce multiple series with each examination. Implementing those reduction strategy and encouraging participation in accreditation program. To minimize the min medical radiation exposure should focus on reducing the number of CT examination. Even though it is uh, difficult to assess, but uh, it has been reported that 30% or more of CT examination may be unnecessary. Finally, uh, as a clinically qualified medical physicist in medical imaging or diagnostic radiology medical physicist, when the patient dose, uh, which is a cumulated effective dose over 100 millisievert, it is our role to perform risk assessment find a way to minimize the risk, provide consultation on patient dose and associated risk. And in conclusion, the radiation dose from medical imaging should be known, not neglected. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Anjali. Sorry for interrupting you because uh, we are exceeding the time. Uh, thanks for uh, giving the review of uh, the radiation and risk and how it is dependent on the gender, uh, time of exposure, and also you have discussed uh, about the weightage factors. Uh, there are many questions, but uh, because of paucity of the time, I will take only a few questions. Uh, just uh, uh, to Anjali, why is still the age 20? Uh, female risk is about double of that male. Any probable reason for this thing? Female at more risk uh, uh, than mm -hmm. the male. Huh. Anjali, can you listen to yes. my question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Could, you, could you repeat the question? Yeah. yeah. Why is till the age of 20, female risk is about double of that of male? Oh, yeah. So this is uh, from the experimental study that the female will have a higher risk than the male. So this is a study from the uh, survivors from the atomic bomb that uh, we conclude that the female will have a higher risk than the male. And uh, at the more, low, weightage factor, more weightage factor and risk factors more radiobiologically sensitive organs? 
Uh, yes, in uh, every in every aspect. So it's a make the conclusion that the female will have a higher risk since they were born until the age at the eighty. So it's close to a female, male and female close at the age of eighty. Yes. And one more question for you is this: Why is the lifetime con attribute risk of the cancer incidence for lung? much higher for women than for men again uh, but for female lung uh, risk is much more lifetime attribute than the male yeah it's the same because a lifetime attribute risk is a calculated from the organ dose so if the organ dose is a high a lifetime attributable risk is also high as well Okay, because uh, there is an equation from LAR that uh, we can estimate from the organ dose. So the first wow. thing that we have to do is to determine the organ dose from the CT examination. And then we estimate uh, the high, highest dose and then we do uh, estimate the lifetime attributable risk. Yeah. Okay, and the risk Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Just two short question to Thomas Cron. Uh, what is exactly mean by CBCT dose, equivalent dose or effective dose? Uh, that, that is an excellent question. Uh, it, it depends, uh, really. Uh, we quote typically equivalent dose uh, because uh, that is something which is familiar with the radiation oncologists and they are interested in the dose to critical structures. So it's the effective dose to the rectum, the effective dose to the bladder, whatever it may be. Yes. However, if we are talking about the risk for the patient, uh, then we can, uh, for example, in a, in a clinical trial, uh, we will uh, use effective dose. So uh, both, both uh, units are used uh, and it is, it, it's a very perceptive question because it is important for the radiation oncology physicist or for any physicist to actually specify exactly what they are after uh, in, in that, that case. Okay, thank you very much. I cannot take more questions because of uh, the paucity of the time because already we have exceeded uh, the uh, time. Uh, so uh, I uh, thank again to IOMP, John Dandelakis, Magdalena, and uh, uh, I hand over the floor to Magdalena if she has any comments, and then to John Damericus to say about uh, this excellent uh, webinar we had. Two excellent talk from the highly expertised, highly knowledgeable people, and a lot of comments we got. Uh, John? Uh, you. Thank you, Arun, for uh, moderating this session. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Anchali, for your uh, pres uh, 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 excellent presentations. Um, yeah, very uh, many, many questions. I, yeah. I wish we had uh, <laughs> one day for discussion, uh, but this is uh, really impossible. Uh, no, no, I won't take more time. Uh, many thanks also to our audience, our colleagues for joining. Thomas, thank you, Anjali, for uh, your excellent talks and sparing time. Though Thomas was traveling, he could spare the time. Thanks to John Damelikas, Megadana, and all the IOMP XCOM. And thanks to large, large participants. Have a nice day uh, ahead, and we'll look forward for another excellent IOMP webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.